credit to YouTuber Bollocks for the gameplay footage used in this review. Thank you so much, I wouldn't be able to make this video without you. Half-Life important game. Valve not make game years. Ha ha, funny three joke. Look, if you're online enough to watch a video like this, you're probably at least a little aware of the context behind the Half-Life series. Half-Life 1 was good, but old. Half-Life 2 was good, and less old. Half-Life 2 Episode 1 and 2 were short and supposed to replace Half-Life 3. Then, as we all know, the series disappeared for over a decade. The last official release with Half-Life in the name was in freaking 2007, and the last game reasonably taking place in the canon, Portal 2, was released in 2011, over a decade ago from now and almost a decade before the series finally getting revived. There were a lot of reasons for the series' hibernation. Ever-changing staff, shifting priorities, Valve's infamously lax outlook on game development, and of course the release of their digital game distribution platform that currently makes all the money ever. There have been things to whet the appetite over the years, Valve supporting mods of the Source Engine to no end, of course. Not to mention two fan games released on Valve's distribution surface for actual money, one being an absolutely stellar remake of the original Half-Life brought up to the standards of the game's sequel, and the other being Hunt Down the Freeman, a game I don't own but will probably buy someday just to take the piss out of. Then around 2016, Valve grew an interest in VR gaming, heavily supporting the HTC Vive and in 2019 releasing their own VR headset, the Valve Index. However, they always seem to use the Portal IP to support VR, which admittedly makes some sense. The Portal series is, after all, based around a high-tech scientific company pushing the boundaries of what can be considered reality. However, in late 2019, the world got a big shock. Half-Life Alex was released in March 2020 for PC. The game is 100% in VR, working best on the Valve Index, but also compatible with the Vive, the Oculus Rift, and even Windows Mixed Reality, which I'm gonna guess most people watching this video don't even know exists. It's Microsoft's weird augmented reality thing that they eventually put out a VR headset for. Only for PC and Windows, though, not console. So they're at the bottom of the toad pole for VR on consoles, with Sony at the top and Nintendo somewhere in the middle? What the hell am I talking about? Alex, the game, not the character, was praised when it came out, with many declaring it the best VR game ever made. It was definitely one of the biggest, being one of the only full-length, completely original games released for the medium. Most VR games to this point were either ports of games that weren't originally in the medium, or short, bite-sized experiences based around showing off the tech. There were some exceptions, but in general, this was the biggest release VR could have gotten, and it took me two years to play it through all the way. Not because I didn't have a VR headset or didn't like the game, because I had one and I liked it, I'm just very inattentive, and also there was a pandemic. Well, still is at time of writing. I should talk about the game at some point, shouldn't I? Half-Life Alex is mainly set in between the events of Half-Life 1 and 2, closer to the latter than the former, and concerns the titular character journeying through City 17. I don't want to give too much of the story away, as this is an incredibly story-focused game, but as a brief sort of snapshot, the majority of Alex's journey is through the Quarantine Zone, established by the Combine, the alien rulers of Earth and probably a million other planets, in order to, at first, rescue her father, the leader of the Resistance. Again, I don't want to spoil too much, so I'll just say the story takes a fair number of turns throughout, so don't expect to just be trying to save Eli for the whole game. The story of an interqual is always a tricky thing to balance, as you have to deal with the fact that, at least in terms of major world-changing events, you can't really do anything too new. You can introduce new characters and explore different sides to pre-existing ones, but whenever a character in the game talks about how the mission could potentially save the world and chase off the Combine, you kind of know straight away that they aren't exactly going to be successful. However, the ending does kind of throw that aside for reasons I don't want to spoil, but let's just sum it up like this. Time fuckery gets involved. Yeah, that's kind of spoilery in itself, but fuck it, I'm trying to talk about the story here. I need to reveal something about the plot. There aren't too many characters you interact with, since like in most VR and Half-Life games, the game has to compensate for the fact that you could, at any moment, decide you're bored of the story and just want to either focus on something else or shoot everyone you're in a room with. The main characters you'll spend the most time with in the game are Alex, your player character, and Russell, the voice in your ear who helps guide you through the game. I will say, while there is obviously a lot of Half-Life style in the dialogue, I feel like Valve's experience with the Portal games and Team Fortress 2 material has helped them fine-tune their writing. There is occasional disconnect between the more comedic, quippy nature of the dialogue and the incredibly dark backstory and, frankly, terrifying setting, but it still works, honestly. I will say, while we're talking about dialogue, the voice acting can be a bit odd at first, especially if you're coming straight from Half-Life 2. Alex and Eli have both been recast for this game, you see. Eli, unfortunately, had to be recast, 
as his original voice actor, Robert Guillaume, apologies if I butchered his last name, passed away in 2017. His replacement, James Moses Black, does a pretty good job, but doesn't quite replicate the original voice perfectly. Again, it's a necessary change, and Black did an amazing job as Eli, but the change is noticeable for fans. Alex, meanwhile, is now voiced by Ojiyama Akaga. Again, sorry if I butchered that. Not completely sure why she was recast. Sure, Meryl Dandridge is a couple of years older than Ojiyama, and maybe she was busy with The Last of Us at the time, but I don't know. Whatever the case, I'd say Ms. Akaga, why do I keep making myself say people's names, did an excellent job of replicating Alex's voice. It is a little bit younger sounding than in Half-Life 2, which makes sense, but otherwise, come to my head, I wouldn't have been able to tell she was recast. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, writing good, quite enjoy. Ah, presentation. What stands between Super Mario Bros. and moving scraps of paper along a line? Half-Life Alex runs off the Source 2 engine, first used in some Dota-related games and one game that involves the lab. And wow, this engine is a massive improvement over Source. The Source engine isn't bad, but it is definitely more of the PS3, Xbox 360 era. Source 2, meanwhile, is comparable to the Unreal engines, and it is so goddamn good. The environments are detailed, the objects all feel real and complex, and everything is so distinct, even in the darkness of the game. Even the monsters in Combine are all so much more intricate looking than ever before. One of the biggest improvements over Half-Life 2 is the character modeling and animation. Half-Life 2 was well acclaimed for that to begin with, but honestly, Valve's experience with TF2 and maybe even the Portal games seem to have made them masters at this thing. Characters aren't quite hyper-realistic, of course, they're less cartoony than in Team Fortress 2, but they're still definitely not going for total realism in their designs. However, they still feel alive and undeniably human. It's incredible, and the weirdest thing is, it's not even the biggest part of the game. There are only a handful of instances in the game where you even directly interact with other characters, but each instance is made the best it could be. But what is sight without sound other than a blind person who isn't deaf? The music is… alright. Honestly, with a few exceptions, the Half-Life series has never been my go-to for great music and gaming, but it's definitely not bad. The music serves its purpose perfectly, and there are some genuinely good beats in there. It's nothing mind-blowing, but nothing that would make me dock a point off the game's presentation. I suppose I should also point out the sound design, which is naturally great. Everything just sounds right, and you never lose anything important because of a sound effect going off during dialogue. Hell, I'm gonna say it brings the presentation up, because if you're holding a bottle that has liquid in it, you can hear the liquid inside the bottle. Why? I don't know, but I love it. Note going forward, I played this game exclusively using the Valve Index controllers, as well as the Index headset for my full playthrough. Your experience with the game's controls may be vastly different if you use Vive, Oculus, or Windows controllers. Half-Life Alex offers a lot of control options. Even ignoring the disclaimer I probably just hit you with, the game offers choices regarding movement, combat, and even height. Personally, I used continuous movement based on head direction, snap turning at 15 degrees, and toggles for standing and crouching as well as hand climbing ladders and getting lifted by barnacles. Honestly, the amount of options given is really admirable. Valve didn't want to leave anyone behind with certain control options. Unlike Boneworks, which seems to regard teleport movement options in VR like it's some technological roadblock, when, no, we've been able to do continuous motion in games for years, you smug idiots, the option was put in place because a large number of people get motion sickness from continuous movement in VR. Acting like it isn't a problem outside of programming is just making yourselves look like self-righteous assholes. Sorry, just needed to get that off my chest. In terms of standard control, when working with continuous movement and turning enabled, you use the left stick on the index controllers to move forward, left, right, and backwards, while using the right stick to turn. If you have standing and crouching enabled, pushing the right stick in will have Alex stand to her full height, regardless of the player's height or position. And doing the same with the left stick will bring the perspective much closer to the ground, similar to the crouch in previous Half-Life games. It all works really well together, the twin stick controls especially. I will say, since I had my snap turning so small, I had to hit the right stick multiple times to turn a good amount, but at least it meant I could fine-tune my turns when necessary. One complaint I do have, however, is the jump. The game doesn't have a conventional jump button, instead the jump function is closer to a teleport, which can give the player height or go over gaps. The problem is, with the standard control scheme, it's mapped to pulling the right stick down. This works fine enough, usually, but since it's mapped to the same stick used for turning, if you flick the stick for snap turning, it's sensitive enough that you'll probably end up jumping accidentally, which I definitely did more than a few times. It's not the biggest problem in the world, but it will affect you if, say, you find smooth turning to be the one thing that constantly makes you sick like me. However, movement is only half the controls here. 
There's also combat and physics manipulation. Early on in the game, Alex receives a pair of quote-unquote Russells, also known as the Gravity Gloves. These allow the player to grab any object within range and pull it towards themselves. Honestly, it works shockingly well. The pull can even avoid certain obstacles between the player and the object, and it pretty much always takes the same amount of time between pull and grab. So once you have the rhythm down, you can do it without even looking at the object. It's all incredibly smooth. However, while one hand does that, the other tends to be busy with the firearms. Gunplay is incredibly smooth in this game. Over the course of the game, you get access to three guns. A pistol, a one-handed shotgun, and a combine SMG. Each has their own ammo, as well as three or four upgrades each, and they all work incredibly well. I did occasionally have trouble aiming the guns, at least before getting the sights for each one, but to be fair, that might just be because my hand-eye coordination is non-existent. Overall, it feels amazing. Unfortunately, in this section, I do feel the need to bring up a couple major glitches I ran into, one of which I unfortunately can't show you because I wasn't recording when it happened. Basically, at this point in the final level, while trying to turn around, I accidentally jumped about three times and ended up clipping out of bounds, where I went flying off, possibly forever. Honestly, this one wasn't that big a deal, since the last checkpoint was only a few feet back, so reloading didn't cost much. More annoying was a glitch I encountered late in the game, but while firefights was still very much a concern, where the SMG just broke. One of the upgrades I'd gotten allowed it to hold more than one cell of ammo at a time, but the gun's model got frozen in the open position. Reloading a save had to actually be closed at least so I could use the cells inside it, but hitting the open button meant it was stuck open and I couldn't even load new cells in. Not only all of that, but because of the weird checkpoint and quick save system the game uses, the only save I had from before the glitch occurred was almost half an hour and multiple extreme set pieces back. I managed to power through to the end anyways, but it was definitely a mood killer. Holy shit, I love this game! Half-Life Alex manages to combine exploration, combat, and puzzle solving more smoothly than even the other Half-Life games did. You shift between pitched gun battles, resource hunting, and puzzle solving to unlock certain goodies. Also, rapidly, it can be difficult to tell which is which at times. The genre manages to shift so much while still keeping the same basic controls that it manages to feel even more chaotic than the original Half-Life 1, and yet it never loses sight of what it's trying to be. It's incredible. And the unfortunate thing is, I can't really explain why. I'm not an expert on gameplay and game design, I'm barely decent at making YouTube videos. So I'll need you to take my word for it that this game is really fucking good, okay? Okay. In the meantime, let's watch someone way better than me play the game. Question. If and when we get the next Half-Life entry, presumably Half-Life 2 Episode 3, should it have VR compatibility? I ask because one of the most consistent statements put out by the creators of Alex, the game, and the character is that the process of making a full VR Half-Life game mainly focused around making it tailor-made for VR. We've definitely had games converted to VR from non-VR in the past. Bethesda ported Skyrim and Fallout 4 rather infamously, and Subnautica has a VR version bizarrely enough, but Valve seems determined to make their VR experiences fit VR as best as possible. And that means if we do get a non-VR Episode 3, we probably won't get inbuilt VR for it. And that's kind of a shame, because I honestly feel like the transition to VR has done wonders for the series. This is one of the best games in the Half-Life franchise, arguably one of the best games Valve has ever made, and I really do hope we can get a lot more experiences like this in the future. I freaking love this game. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> 